Christian, great to have you here at the iNetworker channel. My pleasure. The first question is mm -hmm. uh, actually about, so where do you feel yourself at home? Uh, Budapest, uh, Berlin, so now you're going to Italy, Central Asia, I don't know, so because you live so many places. Well, that's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> and and uh, I really don't know the answer. I mean, I, I assume the reason why I haven't stayed uh, in Budapest all my life is that I was looking for something else. Uh, so I didn't want to stay just there in that uh, city where I was born. Um, maybe it's also because um, my background is a bit uh, like weird or special for like a Hungarian case because like one of my parents is from from Germany the other one is from Hungary uh, there is also quite a few representatives of German minority mm. in Hungary as well so it's not uh, a special case uh, that uh, that uh, a person has one of the parent, parents of the German origin uh, it, it depends um, those are those are different Germans I mean those are the, the people who I mean those are Germans who uh, who lived there for many centuries mm -hmm. and in the last century or so they completely forgot the, their language so none of them speaks it anymore so I, I don't think it's an existing minority anymore and while my background is from the GDR from the from East Germany so that's a, that's a, that's a different and it's a not really a typical thing mm -hmm. I think um, as such it's, it's it's not a typical thing because usually people think of um, migration in, in terms of east to west or south to to north and uh, in my case it was more like one part of my family came from west to east although back then it wasn't that west because it was part of the same uh, uh, eastern bloc Mm -hmm. But still, people were looking at me as with, with, with suspicion, in a sense, because uh, you know, what is a German doing in Hungary? Um, are you there to colonize the country, or mm -hmm. do you <laughs> do you have any plans with us? Uh, what? And then the other way around, uh, mm -hmm. if you say in, in Germany that I'm I'm German, but I was born in Hungary and I have a weird Hungarian name, that they and then they always look at you with suspicion. So yeah. why? Would why do you claim that you're a German? So that's okay. why it's... Uh, but, but, but for you then, then you have two native languages uh, virtually, so Hungarian and German, yes? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we can say so. I mean, uh, back, back at home uh, we used to speak German when I was uh, mm -hmm. a child and then with, with school and everything it changed because there wasn't really German language education in the, mm -hmm. And, and so, uh, so you know, so you you said that you you wanted to see the world not only so Budapest, your, na mm. uh, your native city. So, uh, but for me, uh, uh, Hungarian culture, the Finno-Greek culture, is uh, a very unique example. So when I started learning Estonian, I needed uh, to change uh, um, my mind completely. So just do mm. feel the same when. Uh, you speak uh, Hungarian that you use uh, one part of your mind and when you speak German or English or any other European language you, uh, you, uh, you use another part of your brain. Mm, not for me, but uh, mm. that's true that I hear this from many people who, <laughs> who try to learn the language because it's so, so much different or at least it's especially first if you look at the language it looks so much different but mm. then I think if you just look at it from um, like from from the from the vocabulary, then you see that there are many similarities. Uh, um, I have my own theory, which is not so uh, scientific, I think, but I I believe that uh, once the Hungarians, this nomadic tribe, arrived uh, um, to uh, to Hungary, mm -hmm. um, they they had a set of words, but a, but a very limited uh, um, set of words because they only needed to know things like horse and me and uh, things like that but there were words that they didn't even know that they existed and uh, uh, or concepts or or I don't know um, like 
for example, vegetables and, and fruits and so on that they found in the country, they didn't have words for them because they didn't know they existed. So when they arrived, <clears throat> they had to find a word. And the easiest way to do that was to ask the Slavs who were already there, what is it? And then they told them, this is this, this is that. And then they just took the Slavic words for that. And, and some uh, modifications that do you get? Yeah. I can get rid of it. Yeah, yeah so, so, so I believe that there is a layer of Slavic over the over the Finno-Ugorian layer, then I think there's also a really strong layer of German, mm -hmm. in part because of uh, uh, all the um, uh, German minorities who, who lived in the country and also the um, uh, the um, by the partnership with um, with the Austrians um, for for so many years. Okay, some people wouldn't call it partnership, but occupation. But anyway, there was this uh, cohabitation with Austria, which also brought in a bunch of um, Austrian uh, or German words. The same with Turkey, probably. And then now you have English. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you are um, a child of. Uh two cultures, so Hungarian mm -hmm. and Germany, uh, and uh, the Hungarian one and the German one. So, and uh, uh, what uh, would be your uh, hints for uh, a German person coming to Hungary? So what uh, should uh, he or she take into consideration? So what are the peculiarities of the Hungarian culture? I don't know, maybe Hungarian business culture? And vice versa. So, what are the peculiarities uh, of uh, for a Hungarian coming to live uh, in Germany? So, what should he or she uh, be taken uh, into consideration? So, or uh, there are not too many differences. What do you think? Mm, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, and uh, I'm not sure if uh, if a German who would come to Hungary would. Uh, uh, really experience uh, the the Hungarian logic of uh, of um, of running a business or or, or, or living in an office because uh, um, as as a default I think Germans would arrive in an office which is already multicultural. Um, following a very different different logic from the Hungarian ones. Maybe if you end up in in a in, in, in a startup that's different, but then I think they are also uh, run by people who have this really American mindset. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I guess the only way for a German to really experience uh, Hungarian mentality would be to learn Hungarian first and then really dive into the depths of the culture. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, of course, experience a really very, very, very different way of uh, uh, thinking about the word, about going into your daily tasks. Uh, so Germans, are th I think, are usually thinking and making plans, while Hungarians, uh, they don't make plans, they, they just do whatever they, uh, whatever they find good at, at that point of view. They don't overthink it, which is probably really hard for a German to, mm -hmm. to understand. But I think that's also problematic for Hungarians to do it the other way around. If they have to mm -hmm. get into this like really structured uh, culture or a uh, really structured wor work environment that you find what in do Germany. You a structured way of doing things or... Um, I don't know, chaotic. Mm. <laughs> yeah, chaotic is a good work word, word I think. Um, <laughs> and I think with time, when I'm getting older, I, I feel more and more a need to do something more structured because if you do it the chaotic way, you believe that you can do so much and maybe you, you uh, get some really unexpected um, um, uh, results at the end, mm -hmm. but um, but but there's always a much higher risk that you don't get anything at all, or or that it takes much longer, or mm -hmm. um, something like that. So, if you want to get something unexpected, of course, this chaotic way of working is really really good. So it's it's, it's basically like a, like an artist's way of working, probably. I mean, I hope I am artists don't take it. Uh, in a bad way from me but mm -hmm. I, I believe that an artist doesn't make plans like all the time they just have an intuition and then they do it uh, mm -hmm. and that's how I assume really good works of art uh, come to existence mm -hmm. um, well, but sometimes they just sit there for hours in their studio and they just don't know what to do 
um, yes, so a little bit uh, coming back to Hungary, mm. uh, when uh, I used to work uh, in business so in Russia, so mm. it struck me the, how many Hungarians, our Hung uh, well, would-be partners, uh, would uh, speak Russian. On the one hand, I understand, so this is uh, still the legacy of the Soviet mm. times, but, uh, but uh, another thing is of, course, is, of course, also not only the ability, but also the, the willingness to, uh, to, speak, mm. uh, to speak in a language. Do you think uh, this attitude uh, to Russia is still present in the in the in Hungary, or is it uh, is it more vanishing? So, are there many people who are, who's, uh, who still speak uh, Russian, but not from the older generation, but from other mm -hmm. generations, younger generations? I I don't think there are that many people who speak Russian, so that's why it it, it was. Uh, um, kind of shocking to, uh, for me to hear that there are so many Hungarians who speak uh, uh, Russian. Uh, in industrial mm. enterprises, you know, mm. so just I had a very, <laughs> a very narrow uh, field, uh, field of work, so mm. that's why. Mm. But, but, but it's possible, I mean, there is a cast of like really elite uh, people who got their diploma in, in the 80s or, uh, or uh, early 90s. Mm -hmm. So people from the MG mode, they are still there uh, in many government positions, in businesses. Mm -hmm. And I think those were usually the brightest people who, who got a chance to study somewhere abroad and usually um, the place to study abroad was Russia. So, mm -hmm. um, so therefore, I believe that there are lots of people uh, in the leadership and business leadership who still speak Russian. Mm -hmm. But, um, but uh, Russian as a language taught in schools wasn't really taught well. I, 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 I heard it from like family members that they didn't speak a word, that they got the worst grade uh, in the end, that, that usually this was the class when uh, students just went out to the toilet to smoke a cigarette instead. <laughs> um, it, it, I think it was in, in part it was a protest. Uh, uh, against the language because they saw it as the language of the occupiers mm -hmm. and maybe they just didn't find it interesting either uh, while on the other hand uh, R Russian language was also a language of uh, social mobility uh, so many uh, people from the countryside who who didn't uh, whose, whose parents didn't have a university degree uh, for them uh, getting into university meant that they would study Russian and then become Russian teachers and then they can come from the villages, they can come to the cities and then they become the Russian teachers which is already like one step higher than it used to be in their families. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that uh, that once uh, you nearly met uh, the Russian president, how come? Oh yeah, um, that was uh, my first uh, trip to Russia. I think it was 2010. Medvedev was the president back then. And um, um, I was still in undergrad or that was around the end of my undergraduate studies. And we saw on a, on a forum, I think it was some EU related or EU funded education forum advertised the summer university in Russia. It was, uh, I think it was called Youth Forum Russia or whatever. It took place at Lake Saliger and um, usually people who are familiar with Russia would already say, ah, Saliger, that's the camp where the Nashi movement is uh, um, having its trainings every year. Yeah, so we applied and um, fortunately in just two days we got uh, a, um, a response that uh, we, can apply, we can participate. Um, um, the, uh, the university in, 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 in Hungary has paid our flight tickets, so it was really good, mm -hmm. um, or at least we thought. No, it, it was a really good experience, but it was really different from what we expected because we arrived to the, uh, to the camp uh, um, where, the, where this uh, summer university uh, took place and it was uh, guarded by people with machine guns and then they were checking our bags if we had uh, any alcohol or any weapons or anything because alcohol was banned from, uh, from the camp.
camp and then we had like a really strict schedule every morning we had to get up i think at seven or eight uh, to the uh, to the sound of the russian national anthem but it also looked a little bit like uh, this rock festival uh, in, in in hungary the sigat festival which uh -huh. was back then quite popular mm -hmm. but instead of like these advertisements that uh, that we were used to like coca-cola now mainly pepsi and stuff like that we had huge pictures of putin and medvedev um, <laughs> So, yeah, so but uh, uh, did you meet uh, the Russian president? No, unfortunately not. So what happened was I was just walking around in the in in the in the camp and a guy who uh, Mirza who was our uh, leader or the leader of our group came to me and asked me, "Are you number 568115 um, whatever?" And I looked at my badge and I <laughs> said, "Yes, that's me." And he said, "Okay, come follow me." Mm -hmm. And he took us to a uh, to like a separate part of the camp mm -hmm. and some people were already waiting there nobody knew what's what's going to happen so mm -hmm. uh, uh, I remember there was a guy from China who was really afraid uh, I mean I, yeah so he, so he was afraid he didn't know what happens there was one guy who lost his badge and he thought that it's going to be his punishment or that we are going to be, to be punished somehow <laughs> <laughs> but but in the end, um, a, a guy from one of the ministries arrived. Mm. He was a really smart guy. He he started talking uh, Chinese fluently with the Chinese guy, then Spanish with the Mexican one, and so on. Mm. And then he said, "Guys, this is your lucky day. You're going to visit. Uh, you're going to meet the, the the president. So back then, the president was Medvedev, and uh, you will have the chance to ask uh, a spontaneous question to the president." Mm -hmm. And we said, oh, nice, nice. And then he said... Let's make a rehearsal for that. No? Yeah, it, yeah, he said, here's the list of spontaneous questions. And he oh, took... Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he had a notebook with a list of questions. And then he said, okay, so this first question should come from someone from Asia. Who's here from Asia? You. Okay, you're going to ask it. <laughs> And so what was your question? I didn't get a question in the end. There weren't enough questions. I think we were 10 people were chosen and he had maybe six or seven mm -hmm. uh, questions. But also there was like a big storm and they somehow delayed uh, the, the visit of the president and so on. So in the end, uh, we just decided to leave uh, earlier and check out Moscow instead. Further east, um, mm -hmm. I was quite curious to know that, uh, that you also went to uh, to Central Asia and uh, remarkably to Laos. What mm -hmm. did you do in Laos? Um, so in Laos, the first time I was there, I was just backpacking back in my uh, university years. And then somehow when I was at university late, or, or when I did my graduate studies, I I had to do an internship and I was really looking forward to working for the UN and I saw that there was an opening for um, for someone at the UN office in, in Laos. So I applied and then I could work there for three months. So yeah, that's basically how I got there. And Yeah, so but uh, was it uh, challenging for you? So just what uh, s struck you the most uh, when, when you came to Laos uh, the first time or the second time? So just uh, something unusual, I don't know. So just what uh, was mm -hmm. uh, for you difficult to cope with? Um, I think there was nothing that, that has been really difficult, but it's probably because I wasn't there for too much time. It, I think first time it was probably a month and then the second time it was three months. And for me it was really freedom that I experienced, being so far away from home uh, <laughs> and not having to think about any problems or anything that are back home mm -hmm. and uh, basically just experiencing a new way of life. Every everything was new and everything was so different from uh, and from from what i got used to so every day every moment was uh, an, an experience or an adventure mm. i mean especially riding a bicycle and uh, and in Vientiane was uh, a bit shocking. I mean, some uh, somebody told me at, at the office that uh, I have to know that uh, um, uh, in um, 
in Vientiane or in whole Laos there are, that there is this rumor that there are three times as many cars than driving licenses so you have to be really careful with the driving culture mm-hmm. um, but um, I didn't really feel uh, threatened or I didn't really feel any danger there at all and it was I don't know it 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 was just this this whole feeling of of being in a, in a, in a completely different universe yeah so but uh, but uh, did you communicate to the local people that they communicate in a different way or so mm. what uh, what did you did you feel or nothing special it was yeah i mean i didn't really have that much chance to i i, I could talk to uh, locals who were working in the ministries mm. who were um Uh, working for the UN and so on, but like the uh, the local locals who were running shops and so on. I mean, you can talk with them, but uh, I mean, I didn't speak any Lao. They spoke 20 words of English, so you, you can find out some things. I mean, you, you realize that, for, for example, they have this idea that uh, um, that Western people only think about money, nothing else, mm-hmm. and they they don't say money for some some reason they think it's called money mm-hmm. and so with two a's and even if even if you go to the exchange shop it's called money and not uh, money uh-huh. so for example and one of my um One of my colleagues had a had a welcoming party, or uh, which is some local tradition that some when when someone arrives to the to the country, then all the neighbors come and visit you, and uh, and they give you some greetings and well wishes, and all the local people they were uh, wishing a lot of money to the to the to the westerners because they knew that that's what the westerners love. Uh-huh. Um, So no spirit, <laughs> no, <laughs> no soul, only money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. And then the other interesting thing that I saw was that in 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 Laos, lots of people used to study in Eastern Europe, uh, mm-hmm. um, and um, lots of people in the so-called elite have um, Eastern European wives. Mm-hmm. And the biggest star in the country back then, uh, a singer, Alexandra. She was half Bulgarian, like one of my contact people in the in the, in the parliament or in the national assembly was uh, a lady who used to study in Hungary. She studied, uh, I think, Hungarian literature, and then somehow she became the head of uh, administration there. Mm-hmm. And she spoke a really good Hungarian. She had a a slight um, Eastern Hungarian accent, which you wouldn't expect. Uh, so because it's the East, yeah, so of course, uh, Eastern Hungarian. Is, yeah. uh, you lived uh, in so many countries, so you experienced so many cultures. Uh, we haven't talked about uh, your diverse uh, professional mm-hmm. experiences, ranging from journalism to um, your teaching at the university now, then uh, Uh, development aid, uh, uh, professional experience, and so on and so forth. I assume so all those uh, professions, all those uh, capacities need very good uh, networking skills. Uh, what are your networking hints, uh, networking secrets uh, you can share with our audience? So um, yeah, it's it's a it's a tough question because I consider myself a really bad networker, and uh, I believe that uh, for me it's more the context uh, and uh, the, the the situation in the world that uh, makes it easier now to uh, get in touch with people. Maybe it's not even. Uh, the thing that people come uh, that, that that I go to the people or people come to me it's just that the, um, the, the situation brings us together it, I think nowadays uh, uh, most people in Eastern Europe for example have the same experience uh, after um, um, some years or decades when they believed that uh, the, um, that they also arrived to a stage in their country where uh, democracy and uh, a better life and new chances and opportunities are are, are, are manifesting in their lives and then uh, the huge backlash coming from governments the, the lost chances in 
life. I think that those are all shared experiences with, uh, with, with Eastern Europeans, at least, uh, Eastern Europeans, Central Europeans. And then you have uh, this uh, fear in, in, in Western Europe as well that something similar might happen. Okay, it's not that they are going to turn into a, 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 an autocracy or a competitive authoritarian state, but still you see, you see Trump emerging in, um, in, in the United States, uh, you see a never stronger AfD in Germany mm -hmm. and, um, and people in the West ask themselves, okay, so what is this phenomenon? And uh, they start getting more and more interested in the experiences of, uh, of people who live more to the East. And I think that, that, that just brings you together. And then um, I think there have been more and more of these forums that allow you to uh, to meet with people mm -hmm. so you don't even have to put much effort into networking you just apply to one of these places and then uh, it brings you together with people yeah so you just need to go with the flow so to say yeah, yeah, I would say. I mean, maybe if you have different uh, interests and uh, and uh, if you come from different parts of the world, it's uh, it's 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 different, or maybe it's harder. But uh, but for now, I think um, um, for for people in our country, it's really just what you said: go with the flow, and then uh, you will meet a bunch of people who are really similar. Uh, in their thinking and um, you meet those people then you meet the friends of those people and the friends of those friends and at some point you just uh, keep wondering uh, how many or you you just lose track of how many Facebook friends or contact your friends you have because <laughs> because you have all these people here and yeah maybe it's also the uh, so, so maybe it's also a bit different if you are uh, living abroad uh, and live, uh, for example, in, in Berlin, because then it's also really hard to not be in touch with everyone from your country or for, from your community. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I guess it's a bit different when you are at home and you want to have the same experiences. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah so but now so your flow is uh, bringing you to Italy. I wish you good luck. Uh, oh, so thank you. This new endeavor, and thank you very much uh, for uh, being with us uh, today. Um, uh, good luck, and see you next time. Thank you. And actually, you're right with the flow. I have never expected to go to Italy or to move to Italy and then I just had to make this decision in like one day and it never even occurred in my life that I will ever have a professional um, activity that connects me with Italy because I don't speak the language and uh, don't know the country and so on so yeah you're right it's the flow and it was my pleasure to be here it was a really great experience okay. thank you